So now we're going to kick things off with our keynote opening address. And it comes to us from Nicholas Badminton. He's a world respected researcher, futurist, author, and teacher with decades of experience, almost three decades of experience under his belt. And he's gonna take a look at the closer look at the major disruptors that will change and revolutionize the transportation industry. Please welcome Nick to the stage. Thank you very much, Patrina. I'm just gonna shift this out of the way, excuse me. Okay, so it's, it's fascinating um, to, to think about the, the, the realms of what we can talk about in terms of auto tech. There are some omissions in what I'm going to talk about today who I just realized when I was chatting to Petrina. I'm not going to talk about 3D printing, for example, that's doing amazing things in auto tech. Um, and there's a number of other areas that I'm ne not necessarily going to get into. But today I'm going to focus in on, a, on disruption and how auto tech is fundamentally changing how we look at the entire automotive business as a whole. Um, my name is Nick Bamminton. I'm a futurist. What does that mean? It means that I look at um, the history of where we, we came from in terms of technology, where we are today. I, ex I extrapolate out things that I call um, signals of change, and I look out you know, 10, 20 years into the future and try and understand where we are headed. So that's what this presentation is about. It's like where we are headed with auto tech, where the disruptions will be, and how the world will change. Are, are we ready? <laughs> One person's ready. Are we ready? It's so always like, yep, okay. So disruption, it, it's a word that's heavily used. Clayton Christensen uh, uh, talked about disruption within technology. But really, disruption is taking the, the course that we feel that we've been, we've been led down and just veering off of it left and right. We don't quite know what direction we're going to take until the people that choose to disrupt that, that natural course that we, we've been told that we should take. Um, off into, into many directions. And I think that when we look at different areas of technology, um, we, we're at a very exciting time where research and development, there's lots of people here today that are doing amazing things, like asking big questions about the world. And really, the big fundamental question about, is this the way that it should be? Because fundamentally, we've been told over the years what the world should be, how we should operate through advertising, through brand marketing, and the such like. But we're about a reimagination re today. And the reimagination, um, it always starts with uh, the industrial revolutions of the world. Industrial revolutions happen across three dimensions, communications, energy, and transportation. If you go back to the first industrial revolution, um, you know, you, you've got new ways of communicating there, um, coal, transportation through steam, steam locomotion, and whatever, through to the modern day. And, and now we've got this amazing exponential growth in technology and change. And really, it kind of kicked in around the early 1900s with electrification, electricity. So electricity changed absolutely every single part of our lives around the world. And then in the 1960s, 1968 to be precise, a guy called Douglas Engelbart um, sat there in Stanford, and he presented something called the mother of all demos. And you can go to YouTube, and you can take a look at that. And he presented like something called a mouse, you know, a, a, a shorthand keyboard, a proper keyboard. He presented like video conferencing, hyperlinking. And that was 50 years ago. And now we've got all of that in our pockets, right? At millions of times more efficient efficiency with our mobile devices. And then in the 1990s with the internet of mobile and, and everything's changed to the 2010s, I'm being kind of generous there, but the last three to four years with artificial intelligence, we're seeing a huge change. And artificial intelligence can be actually seen, like Andrew Ng says, um, artificial intelligence is the new electricity. It's that new point where we actually have a huge amount of exponential growth and it will be absolutely everywhere. And I'll cover that in, in some depth in this presentation. But this is where we are with the fourth industrial revolution, as some people call it. Digitized communications, renewable energy, automated transportation and logistics. These are all internets. These are all connections. These are all ubiquitous sensors, big data as a foundation, and processing that enable us in the world to make changes more quickly and to look at the world in different ways, um, to be able to, to enact change, not only from a research and development perspective, but from a daily life as well. Okay. So that's sort of the beginning of where we are, the foundation. 
And this fourth industrial revolution is, is being, being accelerated by a number of different technologies. And, and I like to look at signals. And I, I look, look for what I call signals of change. It's the things that you look at down the street, and it's like, I've never seen that before. That's really interesting. Oh, there's suddenly 10 people doing that. It's, for example, when you go down to San Francisco and you see 25 different versions of self-driving vehicles. You know that change is coming. It's not everywhere, but it's likely that it's going to be coming um, thick and fast. And I like to, to call on this quote by Paul Sappho, because it does take a long time for change to come. Because we don't just release a piece of technology and then suddenly we use it, and then it, it seeps into culture immediately. He says it takes about 30 years for a technology to seep into culture. If you look at something like virtual reality, uh, augmented reality that's being used right now, certainly in the automotive industry, it's taken about 30 years for that to gain pace. It took about 30 years for mobile to really gain a lot of the pace that we have today as well. And it's the same with a lot of different um, parts of technology. But that 30-year change, it's a cultural change. So a lot of the things I'm going to talk about today are, are there. It's just people not being used to them being there. So it's us being able to take it into our lives and to, to roll forward with that. And, and what's really interesting about the automotive industry is, it, to me, the, the traditional automotive industry isn't, doesn't really want to change very quickly. And that's controversial to some people in the room here. But, but really, it, when you upset the order of things, you have to change so many different elements, especially where supply chains and very complicated machinery like internal combustion engines uh, are, are sort of considered. You, you can't just flip and change year by year. But now we're at that point where the flipping and changing is happening on, on a six month by four month by one month basis. Right? So where are we in the industry? Well, we know where we came from, from the bicycles, from the, the first car, from the, from the Benz brothers, uh, through to looking at hybrid technology, and then into you know, um, Tesla's electric vehicles as well. Obviously, we're a little further than that now, and that's what I'm going to cover in the rest of the presentation. Now we've actually got a new center for the automotive industry in North America. It's not Detroit. It's Silicon Valley. And everyone's there. It's really interesting to me the amount of traditional um, companies like BMW, Hyundai, Volkswagen, uh, Mercedes-Benz, Toyota, whoever, that have all gone down to the valley. It's because that's where research and development dollars are. It's where the talent is. Because now, the automotive industry and the cars that we drive and the trucks that we drive, software is the platform. Hardware is the enabler. And, and if you just look inside a, a modern vehicle, you've got so many different sensors, so many different providers, so many different OEMs. It's different. It's not just hardware. It's about the software. And these are the new car companies. Who, who, hands up who's got a Dyson vacuum cleaner. Yeah? Like, they're expensive, no? <laughs> right? I, I've got a Dyson vacuum cleaner. Um, would you buy a Dyson electric vehicle? Right? <laughs> Maybe. I mean, it, it's interesting. They've just dumped $2 billion into uh, research into electric vehicles. Do you think James Dyson can make it happen? Yeah, of course. He's, he's revolutionized one industry already. But like Lyft and Tesla, you know, Amazon, SoftBank. SoftBank's like a, a juggernaut um, driving ahead. Alibaba, Alphabet, Microsoft. And, and financing of new auto tech and automotive is, is increasing over, over the years as well, all the way from 2012. You can see the, 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 the huge growth that's actually coming in terms of that investment. And it's coming across these, collaboration, partnerships between different companies. I think, I think the collaboration and partnerships are, are happening at a greater pace now today than they ever have done in the automotive industry. Uh, investment and, and mergers and acquisitions, there's lots of companies being acquired by the larger car companies like, like Ford and GM and the such like. And vertical integration within those companies that they're, they're developing whole new areas around you know, virtual reality, 3D printing, but auto autonomous vehicles as well. It's really interesting time to be alive in the auto tech and the automotive industry. So one of the very first signals of change I ever talk about in relation to uh, transportation in any industry is around energy, because I think we're at a tipping point. I think that we're at a position where we, we've done incredible harm to the environment, and we've never been so polluted as we are today. This is, we're at a, a point in time where we have to change our habits away from burning fossil fuels. So this is where we get into thinking about solar. 
Now, I don't know if you've ever seen this before. This is green panda out of China. This is about a 300 hectare um, solar panel farm. Isn't that amazing to be able to see that? Um, well, the World Economic Foundation, uh, sorry, World Economic Forum um, actually says that um, we're installing about 70,000 solar cells an hour right now. Most of those are in China as well. The, the, the cost of solar has, has dropped exponentially, and the amount that's being um, installed has been installed uh, exponentially as well. It's almost uh, near zero cost to install solar. But what if it isn't sunny? Well, people in Finland have developed like these black, black solar cells that use nanotechnology to be able to be uh, almost equivalent efficiency as normal solar cells. So even on cloudy days, it can generate electricity. That's a game changer. Another game changer is these guys out of the University of Michigan and MIT. They came up with uh, completely transparent solar cells. Imagine every building that you see around you that's covered in glass, covered in these solar cells. These aren't as efficient. They're about half as efficient as a normal solar cell, but that's not a problem because you have twice, three times as many of them. In fact, if you covered One World Trade Center in New York City in these uh, transparent solar cells, it would power 350,000 homes in the New York City area. Right? So these things are game changers, the signals of change. And then... Do you remember when, uh, when Australia were having problems with, with power outages and Elon Musk went on to like, Twitter uh, in an earlier, more sane version of himself than he is today? Um, I love Elon Musk. You'd never bet against Elon Musk, right? Um, he, and, and they said, oh, we're going to put in the world's largest um, lithium-ion battery farm for you, and we're going to help you solve the problem of electricity in, Aust in southern Australia. It costs about 90 million Australian dollars to implement this, um, which he did in under 100 days, right? Pretty phenomenal. Um, and the first um, revenue numbers in the first six months of operations are around $13.1 million. So hey, that's going to pay back pretty quickly, right? What's the future? Is the future burning fossil fuels, or is it, it harnessing an unlimited supply of energy from the sun? I think we know the answer to that, right? And this is the absolute future that we're heading towards. Now, this isn't happening in the next five, even 10 years. But we've got the idea that we could build smart grids that, that cross boundaries and borders, that we can share abundant you know, renewable energy, whether it's from wind, just like that, that wind farm down in Australia, or from solar, um, from, from wave energy, and pass it across borders to wherever we need it in the world. This kind of global energy interconnection is going to absolutely and fundamentally change how we look at energy. Now, we're probably looking beyond 2030 or even 2040. But down in Asia, the, the Asian supergrid is being planned across five different countries right now. And we'll see that within five years. You know, China, Russia, Japan, um, South Korea, a, a couple of other countries as well are going to be sharing electricity in a way that, that's an early predictor of what this is going to become. So what do you do when you've got unlimited energy like that? You use that energy. And that brings me on to the next part of the, the presentation. Electric vehicles. Who owns an electric vehicle in the room? OK, well, one, two, three. What, what electric vehicles do you own? You've got a Volt, PHEV, right? Your PHEV? A Volt or a Bolt? V. So we've got three PHEVs, and I've got a Chevrolet Bolt which is a full electric, because I'm brave. Not really so brave, and I'm going to explain. I took this picture in Vancouver two weeks ago in Pacific Center. They've got this big, flashy place. <laughs> They've only got about eight places you can charge vehicles, right? But I'm, I'm, in BC alone, about 280% growth in the last quarter of electric vehicles hitting the road, mostly because of Tesla 3s. Right? It's actually surprising that no one in the room's got a Tesla 3, because in Vancouver, there are there are a lot that have hit the road. But if you look at this, you've got, like, uh, you've, got the, you've got the Audi, you've got the BMW i3, and then you've got the Kia on the edge. And that's my car, Ziggy, which is my Chevrolet Bolt. You can drive 400 kilometers on a single charge. Everyone said, talks about range anxiety. I never even think about charging my vehicle because it's got so much range. Never. No, no, I, it's just a nice to have to have this in free electricity. I've driven over 3,000 kilometers since I've owned that car and spent zero on fuel. 
right? I'll spend nothing. Total cost of ownership of electric vehicles is uh, hitting rock bottom. But over the years, we're going to see this, this total cost of ownership driven change towards electric vehicles coming. And it's going to be a little slower in larger markets like North America because we don't like change, right? And if you still go to, it's interesting to me, when I go to the car dealerships, there's no electric vehicles anywhere. When I went to buy my electric vehicle, there was one for test drive uh, amongst three different dealerships in the whole of Greater Vancouver area. And I had to go and drive my friend Peter's car to just go and see what it was like. And when I did, I saw it as an absolute no-brainer. So dealerships and the automotive ma uh, manufacturers are not helping the change. But there are some countries that, that are really helping. Um, but you know, the, the researchers are doing some really interesting things right now. You know, we've been trying to aim to get to the 1,000 kilometer mark in terms of one charge and, and range. Now, this company is called ITAP. It's out of California. Um, what they did was they took this old BMW. And for $19,000, they, they took recycled parts. And they built um, a, a battery load in this uh, and, and the drivetrain and whatever. And over a two-day period, drove it. 1,204 kilometers. They drove it twice to Tesla to show Elon Musk, but he didn't come and see. <laughs> but I actually think that the 1,000 kilometer range is the thing that is the tipping point for the industry. I mean, hands up who, whose next car would be an electric vehicle if you knew that you could plug it in and overnight you could have a 1,000 kilometers range, right? It, it, it's almost everyone in the room, right? Because it's just. It's equally as good as an internal combustion engine. I would argue that my Chevrolet Bolt is better than, than an internal combustion engine in terms of um, burning fuel and, and cost and the such like anyway. But you go to Norway today, Norway sells, 45% of all the new cars sold in Norway are electric. Now, Norway became incredibly rich from oil and gas, right? Now, they're now divesting away from that in their entire um, um, investment portfolio nationally, which is super interesting. They're also, um, they, they've foregone the taxes on electric vehicles. They actually give you extra benefits like cheaper ferries, preferential parking, a number of different benefits for going full electric. It's cheaper to buy a Model S in, in Norway than it is to buy a BMW M3. And if you're given that choice, what would you buy, right? I'd certainly buy a Model S in that situation. And they actually think the, the, by 2025 in Norway, there'll be 100% electric vehicles will be sold. And they're actually saying by 2040, electric vehicles will be accelerating to about 54% of all new vehicle sales. Right? Do we believe that? I actually think that that's a, a hugely conservative uh, estimate. I think we're going to move a lot more quickly than that. But we're only going to move a lot more quickly if a lot of the big car companies get out of the way and start upping their production. Right. And it's coming to other forms of transportation as well. We saw the Tesla Semi, and now we've got a Volvo Semi coming as well. Over in Norway, we've got the fully electric uh, the car ferry. I was just on the Isle of Skye in Scotland a couple of months ago, and there was a diesel hybrid electric ferry that ran from Sconce to, to Raze uh, across this little strait. It's amazing that technology is coming that far. Um, and the bottom left is a, a, a massive uh, uh, freighter. Uh, um, freight liner from China that goes up the Yangtze River. It doesn't have a huge amount of range, about 40 kilometers range. Uh, ironically, well, it's, it's fully electric, but ironically, it transports uh, coal up the Yangtze River. <laughs> I mean, seriously. <laughs> but I'm not going to talk about China too much. A couple of points in this. In China, they are rolling out about 9,500 electric buses every six weeks. If you, I could have done an entire presentation on China and what it's doing in electric vehicles and how it's going to be miles ahead of who we are, like it is in solar, like it is in other forms of renewables, to, to adjust its sort of carbon footprint, which is pretty terrible. It's going to be there. There's nearly 500 smart cities in China that are under development today as well. So these are fully connected, platform-driven, software-driven, algorithmic cities that are going to be connected to algorithmic buses and algorithmic electric vehicles with self-driving capabilities. It's pretty amazing, right? So you know, looking at the energy moving towards electric, looking at electric vehicles, but electric vehicles aren't going to be the thing that, that really hits us too quickly. And that's probably a good thing for people that work in aftermarket parts. Because this is where a huge amount of disruption actually comes here. Current estimates for lifetime uh, of today's electric vehicles are around about 500 
1,000 um, miles. That was taken from a recent um, case study on a Tesla Model S that's been driven around California. Right? So that's a huge change from where we are with ICE vehicles today. And about 80% of aftermarket OEMs say that they're not, they're not prepared. Right? So if you do work in the aftermarket, here comes some really big disruption for all of us. If you actually look at um, the share of, of how you make money in the aftermarket, you've got wear and tear, crash relevant parts, services, diagnostic products, and a little bit of uh, uh, other pieces of that as well. But that's all going to be changed. Now, what was really interesting is that there was a study done last year by UBS. What they did was they took a, a, they took a Volkswagen um, Golf and they took a Chevrolet Bolt, the car that I drive. And they ripped them apart and they tried to work out the cost of building those vehicles and when they'd hit parity. We've hit parity this year. I mean, Chevy loses a little bit of money when they sell the car to me. But, you know, they're, they're gaining market share there. But UBS, when it ripped, you can download that report. It's, it's about 95 pages and it's very in-depth and thorough about what, what, that, what that means. When it actually looked under the hood of the two different vehicles, they actually saw a huge change. In, in Chevrolet Bolt, there was 35 parts. And really, out of those 35 parts, there's only, there's only four or five that are really moving, and they never break. I never use brakes because I do uh, regenerative um, power generation in my car that does all the braking using the drivetrain. And I sometimes have to put washer fluid in my car. But versus 167 parts in the Volkswagen Golf, and like, yeah, how many times do you need to go and take your car in for maintenance on a yearly basis? It's not a good thing. <coughs> The after sales revenue pool could drop by about 60%, or about $400 per vehicle per year. So the aftermarket gets absolutely devastated by electric vehicles. Electric vehicles, we saw about 54% by 2040, so it's not going to come thick and fast. But by 2030, that industry is going to be devastated in a lot of different areas. You're going to see a lot of people having mergers and acquisitions. Um, you're going to see a lot of the, the companies that produce the vehicles taking back control of that aftermarket as well. That's a couple of predictions for you. This is an upgrade in an electric vehicle. It's a purchase of extra range or, or whatever features that you actually want. This is taken from a Tesla Model X, right? So you want to increase the speed and you want to increase the range. You just like hit purchase, put in your credit card number, and you're done. You never need to see a dealer. You never need to you know, deal with the car company directly. So this is what happens to that, to that graph we had before. You know, um, EVs disrupt wear and tear parts. There's just not that many of them. Uh, autonomous vehicles disrupt crash relevant parts because if we think about it, autonomous vehicles shouldn't crash that often. Software and cloud computing should disrupt the services element of that. That's where the aftermarket is, cloud and services. That takes us on to think about platform. And I think platform is, is as much about business model as it is about technology. And one of the business models that I think is, is amazing is around cooperative car schemes. Does anyone use cop car schemes here? I was using uh, Car2Go a lot in Vancouver before I had my car. Um, there's a, a number of others. What's really interesting is if you actually switch to these services, it actually remove about 14 vehicles from the road per person. Right? So 15 to 1 ratio. And now you've got, you've got instances where companies like Lyft and Uber are experimenting with this. And, U and Lyft actually came out with a scheme earlier this year where for about $300 per month, you could have unlimited use of a Lyft service. So suddenly, you no longer have to own a vehicle. You spend $300 a month for an application on your phone and have on-demand vehicles. And imagine what happens when autonomous vehicles come as well. It's huge disruption, right? And it's not that convenient today. Culturally, we like to have a car that sits for 95% of its life in, in, a, in a parking lot or outside of our house. Why would we do that? Culturally, our kids are not going to think that way. Then Mercedes Men's Bank is playing with this as well. For a monthly fee, you've got access to a number of different vehicles, 12 vehicles for a year for a single monthly payment. Who wouldn't, who wouldn't uh, uh, like to actually try a number of different Mercedes Benz on a, on a monthly basis? Didi, out of China, is doing some really interesting things here. They actually started an e-vehicle e sharing service with 12 automakers, so both Chinese and North American as well. And what's really fascinating about that, it had such a large amount of uptake that it was, it was a car sharing service that let you test drive vehicles so you could think about buying them. So this number of test rides in 90 days was 1.4 million test drives. 
What automotive manufacturer can, can boast that? DD do not make vehicles. They just had the partnerships. And the automotive uh, industry really appreciates these kinds of things, but they know that the disruption is coming because they've got the platform, they've got subscription, subscription is the future versus ownership. And really, by 2040, and that, that, that year's been uh, touted in this a lot, it, it's almost when we hit the singularity, so says Kurzweil and his friends, a trillion dollars in revenue in terms of ride sharing and ride hailing. That's a lot of bread, right? That's a complete change of how we operate today in the world. And that's a lot of vehicles on the road that are being used more. So, you know, is that good for the environment or not? Because not all of them are going to be electric at that point. Okay. So we've seen a lot of disruption in this presentation, but this is when it gets super serious. Um, back in 93 to 96, when I was at university, I did a course called Applied Psychology Computing. I specialized in artificial intelligence and linguistics, and AI was pretty terrible. It just didn't work that well. In the last five years, we've seen artificial intelligence investment rising. We've seen developments um, being invested in. We, we're seeing lots of collaborations. We're seeing the, the largest companies in the world investing billions of dollars in artificial intelligence as the future. And this is where we've gone. We've gone from 1997 with Kasparov being built by a computer for the first time, by IBM's Deep Blue computer, to uh, um, IBM Watson then winning Jeopardy against the best Jeopardy players. And 2017 was really interesting. AlphaGo learned how to play the game of Go, Chinese game of Go, from learning all of the games that went before it and then playing uh, Masters. And then it played Lee Sidol, ninth Dan um, Go Master, and, and beat, it, beat him four games to one. And during the playing of that game, it played intuitive, very human and creative moves that made him a better player. And then following that, about six to eight months later, uh, they created something called Alpha Zero, where it didn't learn any previous games, and it just taught itself over 40 days how to play the game of Go on its own. And it's completely unbeatable. I also learned chess in four hours and became completely unbeatable. And it changed how um, chess strategists and grandmasters think about gameplay. So this is about human and the machine. We get better by using artificial intelligence. This isn't Terminator walking in, destroying everyone in the room, and suddenly being the grandmaster. Th these are tools for us to use, right? The, the, uh, the, the, the conversation that's happening in the media is wrong about AI and the destruction of jobs. At no point in time has uh, a piece of technology come in and destroyed hundreds of millions of jobs globally. They've just created new kinds of jobs. And sure, you won't be having kids flipping burgers in Burger King or McDonald's, because no kids should be doing that. They should be doing something valuable with their lives, right? And by 2030, they think that there's going to be a $15.7 trillion boost to global GDP through efficiency and new industries and growth. So AI is a platform. Um, it's a set of tools. It's, it's going to be the foundation of everything that we do. It's going to be in every single device, every single car, every single university seat. You know? It's going to be an interesting world. But it's not going to be our nemesis, and it's not going to be act, like watching us working out how to destroy us. That's a misnomer. And this is the amount of interest that there's been in autonomous vehicles. And this is where AI becomes real for the automotive industry. And this is, uh, th these are people searching for new kinds of technologies. And autonomous vehicles are front and center of, of the thinking of consumers. And are we worried? No, we're watching this area very, very carefully. And the Department of Transportation in the States actually think that by 2023, we're going to be seeing more vehicles hitting the road as on-demand self-driving vehicles than vehicles that you're going to buy yourselves and drive yourselves. This is a very sober organization. I actually think this is a roundabout right where that tipping point's going to be. I don't think it's going to come that quickly. Isn't it interesting how, as a 16 or a 17-year-old, you can pass your driving test, sit in a, a two-ton two, a two -ton vehicle, drive it around, and don't kill yourself or other people that often? right? But we need to teach cars how to drive two or three million miles to work out how to drive like a 17-year-old. right? So there's still a lot of work to do. And we're not quite there in terms of working out how autonomous vehicles will work in the future. But there are some companies like Ford that have got a really big vision. I'm going to just play this video for you.
and this self-driving capability is being trialed in Miami. You've also got um, self-driving capabilities being, uh, being uh, driven out of, um, out of Arizona right now. And uh, it's really interesting. I just watched a video the other day of a guy who caught a Domino's pizza and it turned up in a, in a self-driving vehicle. You know, it's becoming mainstream, just in, in small ways at the beginning. And then earlier this year, um, this company Embark, it, uh, there was a self-driving truck that drove from San Diego to Florida um, with very little um, engineer interaction. I think about two or three times during that time. Really interesting. And then you've got <clears throat> new companies like uh, uh, Ike, which is named after Eisenhower, who was the guy that revolutionized the, the North American road system. And this is about human and the machine, like I talked about in terms of Go and chess and whatever. Because it doesn't see a future necessarily where these trucks are going to navigate themselves self-driving through cities, but it's certainly going to see it going from port to port on highways. So this is how it works. There are ports uh, that the, um, drivers drive these, these Ike trucks into. The trucks are then sent along their way, maybe platooning along the way, like two or three trucks in a, in a row. And then they go to other ports, and there's drivers that take them the last 10, 15, 20 kilometers. Right? It's, a, it's a hugely interesting world. I think trucking is going to be something that's going to be disrupted before a lot of cities and, and the general use of vehicles. But it's also going to be the most contentious, because these are very, very large vehicles, and it could cause a lot of trouble um, driving through cities. But what is a car? If a car drives itself, can we really say that it's a car? You know, it's a f big philosophical question. This is, a, this is a, a GM vehicle. I actually think this is a design fail because it looks like a car. But they've started to think about what, what if you take a steering wheel and the pedals out of the vehicle? There's about 14 standards that it doesn't meet to be able to pass safety inspection. Uh, safety regulations in North America because it doesn't conform to the normal rules of vehicles. So, you know, there's disruption on a regulation <laughs> level as well. But this is a design fail because why is there two seats sit forward with a little area in the middle for your cups? That's not how um, autonomous vehicles are going to be. This is a company that's really interesting called Zooks. Um, this is one of their test rigs. And they actually see a future where the car doesn't have steering wheels and such. Like. It's got it here for, for learning, and, but they, they think of a platform for the vehicle that's more akin to an office or, or a bedroom or whatever. Very much like Volvo came out with this concept car. Imagine if you could actually have a, a car that drove you overnight from uh, San, Francisco, San Francisco to San Diego or from New York to Boston, and you could just sleep in it. Or if you, if you do a longer commute, let's say you're driving from Waterloo to Toronto for meetings, but you could have three or four of your team members in there, and you can actually have your team meetings along the way with no one worrying about having to drive or being distracted from driving because of the conversation, right? This is the absolute future. I actually think that some people may choose to live in cars, but in the future, living in a car is not going to be a negative thing. It's going to be someone that chooses to live in on-demand, you know, BMWs or, or whatever that are luxury and actually pay maybe $100 a night to actually stay in something that's luxurious and drives them from one place to another whilst they, whilst they sleep and, and they can do work all over the country. It's a complete disruptor. It's a complete game changer. A car is not a car. I really love this idea from Mercedes-Benz with the Ermanetic. It's just... It's just a platform. So on the, on the right-hand side there, you've just got the wheels and you've got the powertrain of the vehicle. And then you've got personal vehicles or you've got transportation vehicles that can be plugged into that. Plug and play vehicles. I think that this is a big idea that's going to actually change how we operate and how companies, especially logistics companies, can, can meet small and large demands going forward. I think it's fascinating. Ford sees a city that's very different, fewer cars. What are we going to do with all of the parking space in the world? Right? Vertical farms, cheap accommodations. Who wants to live in the basement? Level 3, P3, where do you live? Right? But what's interesting is the future of the city is this. It's, uh, it's less stressful commuting, car crime, parking, city center retail, healthcare emergency services, centrally located offices, car washes, mechanics, auto dealerships, and fewer restaurants. It's more distributed living. It's not to say that all of these things will be absolutely disappeared. They just won't be in the cities like they are today. Right? If you go to Vancouver today, I think that there's something like two 
um, gas stations in the whole of near to the downtown core of Vancouver. Whereas before, they used to be on the corners of the busiest streets because people would be driving everywhere. Things are already changing. But the good, good news is that with this technology, we're going to have more housing, more parks, less expenditure, improved health and well-being, and jobs and infra in, in infrastructure support for all of these changes. So with technology comes new jobs and a burgeoning economy. It just shifts around, right? And then on to ethics. So self-driving cars, and we, we've heard about this. You know, we, we've heard, oh, self-driving cars, if all the cars were self-driving, we'd save ourselves um, nearly 1.3 million deaths a year. It's not quite that simple, because humans aren't necessarily the smartest people in the world, so there's always going to be deaths, right? We've heard about the trolley problem. Has anyone heard about the trolley problem? The ethical problem of, like, but what if, if the autonomous vehicle needs to make a choice to kill that person or these 10 people? Well, you know what? An, electric, uh, sorry, an autonomous vehicle is not a trolley. This is, this is a, an ethics debate around trolleys and, and railway systems. Do you know what? Cars just stop. No one dies. Right? So let, let's move on. Think ethically beyond the trolley problem um, and think about, how quickly do we, do we deploy these platforms? This is a quote from Anthony Lewandowski um, in 2016. Uh, he's a very famous uh, Google engineer in self-driving vehicles. He's now created a religion where AI is the god. Uh, he's, he's very controversial and provocative. We should deploy the first 100 cars as soon as possible. I don't understand why we're not doing that. Part of our team seems to be afraid to ship. Yes, because the team's afraid to kill people. right? So there's two sides of the coin with how quickly do you put the technology out there. We've already seen some problems, right? We've already seen a death with Uber. We've already seen a death with Tesla, yeah? And sometimes this is human error. In fact, both cases, it's human error. Because do you know what? Self-driving vehicles don't have a self. We have to build in the ethics and, and, and the rationalization um, from human engineers. Um, and autopilot is an auto, really. We've got, the, we've got the point where the Toyota North American CEO is still saying, people are still going to die in vehicles on the roads, right? Unfortunately, it's very complicated with millions of cars driving around, not all of them being self-driving and, and humans being in charge of certain elements. Today, it's driving the vehicles, and in the future, it's programming the vehicles and training the vehicles on test data. So there's the Tesla problem, right? And the crash that happened, um, I think this is down in California, um, and they're not particularly sensitive people, the people at Tesla. If you look at their press release, it's pretty disgusting. We empathize with Mr. Huang's family, who are understandably facing loss and grief, but the false impression that autopilot is unsafe will cause harm to others on the road. NHTSA found that even the early version of Tesla autopilot resulted in fewer crashes. So now, it, now they're saying, look how good we are, and, and basically, like, he's dead because he was stupid. This was, their, this was their official press release after this guy died with autopilot. Why do they call it autopilot? They should call it assisted driving, right? And make it very clear. I, actually, when you go in the car, they make it very, very clear. So the guy made a, made a huge problem, uh, a huge error with his driving style. And unfortunately, he passed away. And then there's laws, rules, and regulations. In Germany, um, one of the ministers there, uh, the word in transportation uh, ministry, actually said, oh, let's look at new laws for driverless cars. So people are already trying to think about you know, enacting these laws. Yeah? So property damage over personal injury, um, never distinguishing distinguish between humans based on categories such as age or race, you know, all of these biased things and whatever. So the world's getting hugely interesting. In the automotive industry, having to think about ethics and bias and training and data, artificial intelligence, electrification, um, all of the platforms, cloud, cloud computing, availability of service, it's a completely different world. I actually think that the automotive industry is going to be stronger than ever before. It's just that it's going to operate in a way that's completely different. And then we know about the problems, that once you put things onto a network, uh, you put controllers into vehicles, there's already about 25 to 30 computers in an average new vehicle today. If you uh, exponentially grow that in, into self-driving vehicles and you have them connected to the cloud, you're going to have people trying to hack that. What's the biggest risk of hacking in a data center? It's loss of data with a car, it's the loss of life. If you actually look at what WikiLeaks did with their release of something called Vault 7, I think that happened uh, towards the end of last year, they actually identified that the CIA had programs to try and work out how to hijack vehicles to use them to kill people. 
that's fun. And then you've got the people at Kaspersky that were the people that helped to hack the, uh, <laughs> the, the Jeep. And we've probably all seen the video of, uh, on Wired of the Jeep being hacked. We should be worried. And we should actually have an entire culture around cybersecurity in every single part of the automotive uh, supply chain. Right? And if you've got a question in your mind, it's like, am I doing enough? You're not. You're not doing enough to protect yourselves. And if you've got kids that want to have jobs for the rest of their lives, tell them to um, get into cybersecurity. That's why I chose data when I was a kid. And then looking at experience. So when these vehicles change and, and the ecosystem changes, what, what's that experience like in the car? Well, actually, uh, Uber has got this patent for in-vehicle virtual reality experiences. Suddenly, you're in the Bahamas, but actually, you're on the 401 for three hours. But you're more relaxed when you get out of the car after three hours because you've had a nap and you've been able to you know, chat to your friends across the world because they've been in virtual reality as well. It's a different experience, right? It's kind of nice to think of it in that way. Or, you know, this luxury, vehicle, relaxed, sightseeing experience that we could have. I, I talked earlier about the car that becomes a hotel room, becomes the classroom, becomes the office, becomes the nightclub. How about an interconnected nightclub where you don't have VIP lounges, you just got, you know, the, the BMW, the, the Mercedes Benz and whatever, and they're driving around one part of Toronto, Windsor, London, Paris, Tokyo. I'm not really going to talk about flying cars so much, but I do want to say that this is Larry Page's flying autonomous car, and they're coming. Uber's already started that uh, as a route forward. In LA and Dubai by 2020, you're going to have flying, flying taxis in those places, and it's kind of incredible to think. It's like, where's the flying cars? It's like, well, they're coming. They're not going to be numerous. There's not going to be thousands of them per city, but th this is for the people that really want to be flash. How did you get here? It's like, I flew in my uh, flying on-demand car. People are still dying in the, in the tests of these, by the way. It's, it's pretty dangerous. So where are we headed towards the future? OK, I'm a futurist. I, I've looked at a lot of things that are happening today. I'm, I'm making a few predictions about where we're going in the future. Some people aren't going to believe them. Trust me, I think that I'm pretty much on the money. I actually make monetary bets on a lot of this stuff. Um, and it's because of this, Amara's Law. I don't know if you've ever heard of the Amara's Law, but it says that in the short term, we completely overestimate um, the effect of technology. And in the long term, we completely underestimate the effect of technology, right? AI, Terminator, in the long run, it's going to be running every single part of your life, right? Those kinds of examples. In, in the short run, um, self-driving cars everywhere in the future, actually self-driving cars everywhere but a complete disruption of the automotive industry, how smart cities work, how society works, and how kids don't even look at a vehicle and think that it's a car that they own. So what do I think is going to happen? 2025. A lot of futurists don't like to make predictions, but I do. So self-driving taxis, transit, and trucks become commonplace by 2025. Electric vehicle adoption starts to rise exponentially with more charging infrastructure, which is key, and incentives being available. Government has to step up. Cooperative and on-demand autonomous driving seats start to normalize autonomous driving in cities. And that's because we have to have a cultural change. In 2030, what's going to change? EVs will drive 200 kilometers on single charge as standard, and uh, people won't really buy internal combustion engine vehicles. In fact, I think it will become so expensive to insure those vehicles and own those vehicles in the future, it will actually be prohibitive to own them. Human-driven vehicles outlawed on highways, replaced by on-demand city-to-city transportation and onboard cloud-connected autonomous systems. I think by 20, 20, 2030, this is going to be an absolute reality. And I haven't even put any guesses about what 2050 is going to bring us. It's going to be completely different. And that's a long way to look out. I'll be honest. That's, that's a little difficult for me. So where are we today, and where are we headed towards the future? Well, we're, we, we are a place today where we've got a huge amount of opportunity to make the changes in the world that fundamentally redefine what automotive is. This is the Autotech Symposium. I'm very excited to be here. Come and chat to me. We've got some time for some questions now, I think. And my name's Nick Barrington. I'm a futurist. Thank you. <laughs>